What's up guys, Houndish here, and today I wanted to cover the basics of the King's Fall raid. So maybe you've never played this raid before, maybe it's been quite a while since you have played it, so this can hopefully serve as a bit of a refresher. I'm not going to cover the jumping puzzles inside of King's Fall, because that would just make for a very long video. The bulk of the content is of course inside of each encounter. So let's get into it. For the first encounter, you'll need two players to run relics, one on the left and one on the right, with two other players on each side to clear clear ads and shoot down the glass doors. You'll dunk the first two relics at the start of the encounter and then bring relics from the left and right sides back to the statues and dunk them until you have lit up all of the statues. Every time you clear a round, the new relics will spawn further away on the left and right sides, but it's a pretty easy encounter just to get you warmed up. Now let's move on to the Annihilator Totems or Power the Glyph section. Here you will need to hold the left and right side Annihilator Totems while trading either the brand of the Unraveler or the brand of the Weaver depending on which side you take. To start you'll need two to head left and two to head right with another two players on the middle plate. The two players on the middle plate must also choose either left or right as they are going to swap places between the middle plate and the Annihilator Totem on their side. The first player to go left or right will pick up the brand and then head to their totem with their teammate and stand underneath it inside of the ring. The player who has the brand will have a 30 second timer before it runs out. There is an aura around the branded player which the second player must stand inside of in order to trade the brand when the time is up. Once the second player on the totem has the brand, the first player can return to the middle, swapping places with one of the players on the middle plate. The player on the middle plate needs to head back to the totem on their side and stand inside the aura until the brand is transferred to them. At this point, the second player who had the aura can head to the middle, and the player in the middle can return to the totem, ready to take the brand, and essentially you just repeat this process. The mechanic is pretty simple, but at the same time you need to ensure the wizards and knights spawning in the middle are destroyed. You'll want to pay particular attention to the boomer which spawns on the ledge above each totem. These will appear each time that the brand is traded, so be sure to help your teammate to take them down quickly. Simply repeat the brand trading process until all of the glyph markings on the central door are lit up. When you finish this section, you will see the notification that the War Priest deems you worthy. And now we have the War Priest encounter. The basics are that there are three plates, one in the middle, one on the top left ledge, and one on the right. You will need two players on each side to kill adds, but also to hold the plates when needed. You'll need to hold the plates to begin the encounter, but also in order to damage the War Priest. To start the encounter, have a player on each side jump on the plate to spawn the War Priest. For the start of each round, you'll have to clear a few waves of adds until a yellow bar knight spawns on each side. Once each knight has been killed, you will see the notification that the glyph sequence has started. The glyph sequence shows the plates which you'll need to hold, as well as the order that you'll need to jump on them. The sequence itself is displayed on the back of these tall stone tablets. So in this instance, we need the plate on the left first. I say left because that's how the team are going to see it since they're facing the opposite direction. The left player jumps on, and after a second, the next position will be shown. In this case, it's the right side, which means the middle plate will be the last plate we need to jump onto. The last player to jump on a plate will receive the brand of the initiate. You can only do damage to the war priest while inside of its aura, so your team will have to stand close together to do this. I recommend going to the right side for the first damage phase, the middle for the second phase, and the left for the third phase if you need it. The player who has the brand will have a 10 second timer on screen. This is the length of time that the brand buff will remain. You can reset the 10 second timer by killing a nearby acolyte, so to get the best possible DPS, you'll want to kill an add in the last couple of seconds of each stack to extend the DPS phase. Once all stacks of the brand have been used up, the War Priest will call upon the Oculus, and to shield from this, you will simply need to stand behind one of the tablets. Those are the same tablets which also show the glyph sequence. After you've survived the Oculus using a tablet, that tablet will be used up and disappear, meaning that you can no longer use it for cover. So at the very latest, you will need to kill the War Priest after the last tablet is used up, but of course you can kill him much quicker than that if you have good DPS. Either way, each time you do a damage phase and then survive the Oculus, you will have to repeat the process of killing adds and completing the glyph sequence. To do the War Priest challenge, you will need to ensure that no player has the brand of the Initiate more than once during the fight. It's not too difficult, but I will have a challenge mode guide available for that soon. In terms of weapons here, Black Spindle, Ex Machina or Sleeper Simulant do fantastic damage to the War Priest. Up next is Golgoroth. 
For this, you'll simply need three players on the left and three on the right. There's an easy way to do this encounter, but I'll also explain the mechanics in full. So to do DPS to Golgoroth, you will need one player to have Golgoroth's gaze, the rest of the team must stand in a pool of reclaimed light in order to do maximum damage. Golgoroth's gaze is taken by shooting him in the back, and the pools of reclaimed light are generated by taking down the orbs above Golgoroth. When you start, there will be multiple waves of adds. You'll need to clear these out until there are essentially no adds on either side. You'll need a dedicated gaze taker who will shoot Golgoroth in the back in order to focus him in a particular direction. Golgoroth will shoot Axion darts at the gaze grabber, which they need to shoot as they spawn in order to stay alive. While this is happening, you need the team to shoot down a light orb into the pit, which you all need to stand in to do damage. It will only be safe to be in the pit when another player has Golgoroth's gaze. Golgoroth's gaze has a timer of 20 seconds. You can either let this run out or have another player take the gaze, allowing the team to take down an alternate light orb and do DPS for another 20 seconds. The more popular strategy is where you let the gaze run out and then restart the process of killing adds and repeat. For the challenge mode, the minimum requirement is that each player holds Golgoroth's gaze at least once in each phase, which again I'll cover in a dedicated video. Once you have Golgoroth under around a third of his health, you will have Taken spawning, which alongside the thrall in the rest of the encounter will need to be cleared in the pit below so that you can safely do DPS. Another thing to note is that each time you do DPS, a player in the pit will receive an unstable light buff, which explodes after 7 seconds. This can kill the entire team, so when you get this buff, be sure to move away from the team. If a player still has Golgoroth's gaze, you can use this explosion next to Golgoroth for a bit more damage. And that's pretty much it. There are a few tricks to taking and surviving the gaze which you'll need to figure out as you play. Again, the challenge mode makes things more complicated, but this of course is a basic guide on how each encounter works. In terms of weapons, the same high DPS weapons from the War Priest, such as Black Spindle, are what I would recommend. Next we have the Daughters of Oryx. Now this encounter is essentially a training encounter for the Oryx fight itself. When you start, a Relic Runner will be automatically selected and they will need to run a short jumping puzzle to collect the Relic, which they can then use to take the shield off one of the Death Singers. You will need another three players assigned to a plate. There are a total of four plates, the last of which has the Relic above it. The first plate will always be the next plate along from where the Relic is in a counterclockwise direction. So when we spawn in, you can see that the relic is above the front left plate. This means that the next plate along in a counterclockwise direction will be the first plate. If the relic was above the back left plate, then that would make the back right plate number one and so on. For the relic runner to be able to run, these plates must be activated one after another in a counterclockwise direction. So right here, me and the runner jump onto plate one. As soon as we're up, plate two can jump on and then plate three shortly after. While this is happening, the runner will have to start jumping from rock to rock until they arrive at the relic above. You don't technically need to activate plate 4, so generally the additional player will help kill adds in the center. If you're holding the plates, be aware that taken vandal snipers will spawn in at around 15 seconds and you'll need to take these out. Once the runner has reached the top, they will get the relic buff and the team can jump off their plates and head to the middle. Meanwhile, the relic runner will jump onto one of the death singer bubbles and hold X or square to take off their shield. I recommend that you take out the death singer on the left from where you spawn in first and then do DPS from the ledges just underneath the Death Singer. You'll need the team's Relic Runner to get to the group as soon as the Death Singer has been slammed as the aura they carry will protect the team from damage. The aura is once again on a timer here and you'll need to aim to kill the first Death Singer within that timer. Once she's down you can take the bonus time to clear adds and then another Relic Runner will once again be selected. Once this happens you'll be on the timer again but you'll also need to repeat the process from the first phase to take down the Death Singer. So you'll have to be pretty fast here and this is why I recommend that you have a player address each plate so that you can get to your new positions quickly. During the second phase the runner and relic location will be different so you'll need to have good communication to fill in the gaps as needed. For the second death singer kill the top plate where the first death singer died is a great choice for DPS as you'll be up close and you'll have minimal interference from the adds below. You take her down and that's about it. You'll need to be pretty fast and decisive but with some practice it's fairly easy. And now we have Oryx. You'll have the same mechanic present here as in the previous fight where you'll need to hold the plates and run for the relic. The only difference here is that the relic runner is not predetermined so you'll be able to pick your most confident player for this job. Oryx will spawn in and you'll have a bunch of thrall in the center which generally teams will tether or super to generate orbs. 
Once these are down, knights will spawn on the front left and right plates, so take these down and once this is done, Oryx will move to either the left or the right side next to a plate. The plate that Oryx is on will always be number one, so that's pretty easy to identify now. Again, you'll have to have your runner and then three players, one for each of the three plates, and you'll simply repeat what we had to do in the death singer phase. The two players who aren't holding plates need to be bang in the middle with the blessing of light bubble, or preferably blessing and weapons, since the middle players will need to help kill the ogres. Ogres will spawn next to each plate in the same order that they are activated. You'll need to kill these as they spawn very quickly so that they don't move as they will drop a corrupted light, which is the bomb you'll use to damage Oryx. Once an ogre is killed, there will be a light eater knight who spawns behind the opposite plate, and these need to be killed on spawn in order to stop them from destroying the corrupted light. The same process of ogres then knight spawns will happen for every plate in the room, so with help from the players in the center, everything will need to be killed. By the time everything has been taken out, your relic runner will have the brand of immortality relic. Now the team can jump off their plates and head to the center of the room, and the relic runner will need to head to the very front where a knight called the Vessel of Oryx will spawn, and here you can use the relic to slam the Vessel of Oryx, which enables the team to damage him. Much like the other knight spawns from before, you will need to kill the Vessel of Oryx quickly. The relic runner also needs to take the aura of immortality to the center where the rest of the team are as soon as possible to help protect them by using the aura. Once the knights and the vessel have been killed, Oryx will slam the plate he is on, and shortly after that he will open his chest. At this point, the whole team needs to shoot his chest in order to stun him, and this will stop his attack, which will otherwise wipe the team. After this is done, you have two options. If you're not running challenge mode, you can have four players each run to a corrupted light bomb and detonate it by standing inside. Detonating the first four will take a quarter of Oryx's health, and then you'll need to repeat the process three more times. The more common strategy strategy now is the 16 orb strat or the challenge mode strat. In this case, after you flinch Oryx for the first time, you'll all stay in the center killing adds until it says that Oryx regains the favor of the darkness. At this point, he will spawn a darkness dimension in the center of the room and teleport the team into it one by one. Inside, you will have to kill a shade of Oryx, but when you're doing this, you will need to kill the adds on the outside as they will go through into the darkness dimension and there is no health regen inside of this bubble, so those adds need to be taken care of. Of. Also, if you're fighting the Shade inside, be aware that he can come into the bubble and slam with a sword. Either way, once you kill the Shade, you will then be teleported back into the main boss room. From here, you can repeat the rounds as before until you have done four plate cycles and killed a total of 16 ogres. If you've done this correctly, there will be four bombs next to each plate and these will need to be detonated to do full damage to Oryx. To do this, have the players who are holding plates return to where their plates were, with one additional player from the middle heading to the fourth plate to detonate bombs. Stand inside of the corrupted light until you see your name four times and this will demonstrate that you have detonated all of your corrupted light bombs, at which point you can head back to the center. While this happens, the remaining players in the middle must keep shooting Oryx to ensure he remains vulnerable while the bombs are detonated. If you do this correctly, all of Oryx's health will be destroyed and he will return to the front center where you need to shoot his chest once more, this time to finish him off. All of this sounds kind of complicated, and it kind of is, but it just requires some coordination and communication to get done. For both the Death Singers and Oryx phases, good legendary snipers as well as Sleeper Simulant are great for killing ogres. Otherwise though, heavy machine guns and scout rifles are the all around best thing to use. So that pretty much summarizes the basics of the entire of King's Fall guys. I know that was kind of a long video, but for any of you who wanted a refresh or perhaps haven't played this raid yet, but plan on playing the 390 version this week, then I hope this will be useful. If you guys have enjoyed the video, a like and comment down below is appreciated. If you're new to the channel, be sure to hit subscribe if you want to see a lot more Destiny content. For now though, thanks a lot for watching and you guys have an awesome day.